Before we get started, uh, it's probably worth uh, stating the obvious. Uh, this video is like a lot later than it was supposed to be, and the main reason for that is because this video has been like three different things before it finally became this. Because I built up that whole thing about uh, Christmas movies from the 40s and 90s and all that, uh, which obviously this is not. Um, I'm probably going to do that somewhere down the road, even though it's Christmas themed. Uh, probably some relatively down the road, but not all the way down there. Um, so I was going to replace that with a suggestion I got not that long ago to do The Lion King with Frozen. Uh, which would have kind of been seasonal to do Frozen on top of that, and but the thing is, is you know I, I suppose there's that similarity where it's like um, both of them have like royalty that, that like gets shunned or you know self shunned or whatever, and then and it has to somebody has to make a journey to get them and bring them back so that the kingdom can be restored and all that. Um, but I mean, apart from that, um, I guess you could say it would be the whole the sort of Disney Renaissance era versus the more current Disney era and all that. Um, which obviously I've now gone with more like sort of the end of the, like near where it was nearing the end of that sort of original Disney era and then against the Renaissance and all that. Um, but all, the, really what it came down to was that, um, and I hope this doesn't pain people too much for me to say, but I learned after watching it about one and a half more times, Frozen, uh, over the past week or so when all this Christmas stuff was going on, um, I just have nothing to say about Frozen. I am not passionate about Frozen in any way whatsoever. Like, I, I have nothing. I have, I, don't, I have no opinion on Frozen whatsoever, it seems. I obviously did that review when it first came out, but that was in the early days, and I don't, I don't even think I said much back then either. Like, I just, I just feel nothing towards that movie. Um, so, I, so I had to go with something else. And my brother recently said, well, wouldn't it make more sense if you did it with, like, The Jungle Book or something? And I was like, yeah, I probably should have thought of that first. So, here we are. Uh, and I don't think any more explanation is necessary. Otherwise, it would be overkill. So, let's just do what I initially wanted to do anyway, which is talk about the Lion King, and then we'll pick up the Jungle Book afterwards. <laughs> so, not to completely throw away the Jungle Book or anything, but um, I'm, I'm significantly more passionate about one of these than I am the other, so we'll, we'll do this. Another problem with talking about the Lion King, of course, is uh, I was a bit worried about it, because it's like, what can I really say about the Lion King that hasn't been said already? Um, especially, not only being, you know, the classic that it is that everybody knows front to back, um, but the fact that everybody has known it for the past 24 years now. So it's like, what's left? So I'm just, instead of worrying about saying things you maybe haven't heard, because that's probably not going to happen, uh, I'm just going to say how I feel about it. Uh, being not just my favorite animated movie, but one of my favorite movies ever. It's probably the movie I have seen the most in my life, the most times, besides The Wizard of Oz, probably. Um, so, that, so yeah, I'm just gonna say how I feel, and if that's what you want to hear, then great. Uh, and if not, then you've probably just heard it before, so l let's just go. Um, so as I was saying, um, I did, this is probably my first memory of a movie in a theater. I don't think that's a false memory, I'm pretty sure that happened. Um, but I would have been like three at the time, three or four. Um, so, and it's one of those movies where once it came out, it's one of the first movies I remember like getting as a gift on video also. And it quickly became probably the first movie that I knew every single line to. And for a very long time. The Lion King was like, once I got to like first and second grade, uh, and I just couldn't wait to get out of school for the day, if I knew there was about an hour and a half left of the school day, I would literally play the movie in my head from beginning to end to make the hour and a half go by. Um, I don't know if I could still do that, but when I do watch it, it's like I still... There's never a line I don't remember that's coming immediately, so... Um, so it's all still in here somewhere, even when I haven't uh, rewatched it recently. Um, so, um, go, as far as starting at the beginning... Once again, what else can you really say about the opening, except for the fact that it's probably one of the most iconic movies? Like, I could keep saying, you know, animated, like, blank animated movies of all time, but really, I think we're talking all movies of all time. 
uh, as far as like iconic openings go, or pretty much anything I'm going to say about the Lion King. So just so we're clear. Um, so uh, and as far as the opening scene goes, obviously you have the iconic imagery, whether it be um, all the animals in front of Pride Rock or Simba getting the whatever the melon thing is that Rafiki breaks open and wipes on his forehead to the raising of him, which cats, domesticated cats all around the world probably hate forever that this scene exists. Um, and then just that big giant opening with the circle of life that's leading into seeing the just title of the movie on the black screen yet yeah, just a just words on a black screen have never felt so epic probably ever um as that song ends and then when you go into this uh, you, you talk about animated movies like today because uh, when we get when we get more into the jungle book uh which was kind of the start of more recognizable actors taking over for voice work um, and the more, like, the less recognizable voice actors that have been doing it forever um, were kind of fading out in place of them. Uh, they, they still coexist um, in, in, a, in a way, but not near as much as when voice actors were kind of the king in, like, the 30s and 40s era, particularly the Disney era. Um, but it's really kind of become this sort of distracting thing when it's like everybody in the movie is some recognizable voice. You, ever, you watch, I can't watch animated movies anymore without me overthinking who all the voices are. Uh, I, I just can't help it. So um, what's, what's, what's great about The Lion King that still kind of amazes me even now um, is the fact that obviously I grew, like the movie itself is like one of my first memories I can think of. And the, one of the ways you can tell that's never faded is this is like an all-star cast, but even watching The Lion King today, I, I rarely ever associate the characters with the actors in it, even though I recognize them all at this point. Um, because I didn't as a kid, and I grew up just knowing the characters and knowing those voices go with those, actor, with those characters... Um, has just remained with me forever. Even when I when I eventually saw... I was still really young at the time, the first time I saw Ferris Bueller. Never in a million years associated Ferris Bueller's voice with Simba. Um, same thing with uh, when I saw Star Wars, when I was like seven for the first time. Never associated Darth Vader and Mufasa at all. And it's still something that never really just occurs to me. Um, Whoopi Goldberg, like, I, my mom was, has always been a huge fan of, so I, like, she was constantly prominent in my life from forever. Still never even remotely associated with Shenzi at all. Um, and it's like that with like all the cast members, even Rowan Atkinson, the people who are just really blatantly obvious. Um, just the characters are the characters to me, and I really wish that's something I could eventually get back to, but I guess I just know too much now. Um, so going into that, uh, I mean, also the whole thing of... Uh, the, the interesting casting of James Earl Jones and Madison Clare as the king and queen, much like how they were the king and queen in Coming to America, uh, which seems like this really odd bit of casting that would be way too distracting, but uh, no, just, like I said, even today doesn't even occur to me. The characters are the characters, and those are their voices, and there's, like, no outside forces getting in the way of this at all. Um, and I love that. So, um, getting into some of the more bigger points. Uh, I guess we can talk about the whole Mufasa's death scene, the scene that we expect in pretty much every Disney movie now. Um, but obviously this kind of changed the Disney parent death scene forever, because uh, it was still prominent, particularly with um, Bambi's mom getting shot being the obvious example, like the, the prime example. But this was kind of, if I remember correctly, the first time we got, like, really, really up close and personal to it. And, it, and it's kind of more so in the way that you don't expect. Because if you, you got to kind of pretend, I got to kind of pretend I'm, I'm seeing this movie for the first time, like, if I were to see it today for the first time. And it's like, I'm trying to imagine, you see, like, Mufasa fall to his death, and he just kind of falls into the stampede, but it, it does that very interesting cut to the zoom out of Simba uh, without us, like, really seeing it. And it's like, once that happens, you kind of, you probably wouldn't expect that you're going to see anything else about this. And I think it's, I think that was actually the original plan, was to not show the body, let alone uh, the cub going up to it. And we get to see this, we get to see young Simba's denial period <laughs> while he's at his father's body. Uh, trying to, I, I don't fully believe that Simba 
thinks he's asleep. I think this is clearly him realizing that he is dead, and it's just kind of that last hope of desperation. Because um, you can tell in his voice, he knows what's happened. <laughs> um, and th we get that. And, and the thing also is that this is like 50 years after Bambi's mom has been shot. Over 50 years after Bambi's mom has been shot. Um, and th it's it, it took that long to sort of take it in this turn that's like much more in your face than it was in a way that you still don't expect. This movie certainly wouldn't have the G rating it does now going through the, the system as it is now that gives every damn thing PG for any particular reason whatsoever. Um, so, like, I, I think those nature documentaries that Disney puts out are the only G-rated things anymore, ever. <laughs> um, so, going in, going also on that scene, though, one thing that kind of stands out to me is uh, this whole idea of Scar's plan. Uh, when they're in, because it, it's a little bit unclear, I think, because there's the whole thing of, um, he clearly has an intent to kill him by bringing him here into this canyon or whatever it is. Um, and he obviously wants it, because there seems to be a planning period here, that or he improvised at the last minute and went crazier. <laughs> Just in the moment, he was like, oh, I could be more evil. Because um, he seems to have the the whole thing about work on your roar. Um, but obviously we know the stampede is going to start because the hyenas are chasing them. But it seems that he wants, I don't know if he wanted him to like, you know, encourage the stampede further by work, working on his roar or trying to convince him that working on his roar is what killed Mufasa basically. And he's going to use that against him because like I said, getting him down in that canyon seemed like the intent to kill. His plan was for the stampede to come through and kill his ass and hopefully Mufasa in the process, um, which is why he went and fetched him. Um, but then it's like he learns in the moment that he can use that in another way when he gets down here. And not only is it sad enough that we see a cub go through the denial period of his father's death that he's just witnessed with his own eyes and all of its brutal glory, um, Scar gets to the idea of, well, I can use the roar thing against him and make him think he did it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, so when you look at that, it's sort of like, and it's like, and of course, this is immediately followed up with, okay, hyenas kill him. So it's like, this is, he's got the plan to put it in his head that he's responsible for his father's death, but only for the reason of him having that thought for 30 seconds before he's ripped apart by hyenas. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you want to argue any other Disney villain on the evil scale, good luck to you. I know some of them get pretty extreme, but I mean, this is this is particularly... And they're obviously, they're taking, like, you know, you know, Shakespearean influence with this literally being Hamlet and everything, but I mean, it's... Yeah, and as far as Scar as a villain goes, um, not only do we just have Jeremy Irons' perfect voice work, because it was another one of those cases, uh, sort of like, they've done this all, they did it with George Sanders when he did Shere Khan in the Jungle Book, they did it with uh, Vincent Price when he was Radigan in The Great Mouse Detective. Um, the idea of kind of taking the actor's performance and making Scar sort of like that, based on what Irons was doing while he was recording it. Um, but on top of that, and the fact that he was like, the large influence of Casting Irons was his performance in Reversal of Fortune, uh, where he's suspected of murder, and even has one of the same like line deliveries in The Lion King when he says, you have no idea. Um, is an ex like, om that dialogue, the audio could almost have to been taken directly from Reversal of Fortune. Um, but the look of Scar also, to where it's like, you're pretty sure this guy was born evil. Like, when this, like by his appearance, this guy had no choice but to be evil. Um, because obviously his name is Scar, and he's got one. I, I, I heard somewhere what his real name is, supposedly, and, like, the lore or whatever, but I can't remember what it is. But just his appearance, also, where he's just, not just, like, how he looks different and his, you know, hair is darker and all that, but you'll notice, like, the yellow, I mean, they've all got yellow eyes, uh, where white usually is, but where all the others usually have, like, you know, some sort of light color or something, he's got those green eyes, and on top of the yellow they've all already got, it's like he's, it looks demonic, his eyes do. Um, and there's also the little detail where um, you'll notice how, like, like a lion or a cat or whatever, the way the claws sort of come out, like, on command. Um, like, it, the first taste of that we get is when Simba's, like, clawing at Rafiki's staff. But um, scars are, like, always out. 
Uh, like, they never go in and out. They're just always visible at all times. Uh, which I thought was a really cool detail. Um, but then there's uh, the whole idea of this is how dark the movie goes. Uh, with this character in particular. So it's like, obviously we're going to have comedy relief. And I know a lot of people think that, um, as beloved as the movie is, that the comedy relief can be a bit tone-shifting in a weird way. Um, so what you've got here is, uh, actually the first, do well I guess technically the first dose of comedy relief we get is Zazu, I guess. Um, but the hyenas are kind of the direction I want to go. So when you get here, um, obviously there there is something a bit, you know, off-putting about them, because they do come out of a giant skull, and, you know, they're laughing maniacally. We learn pretty quickly that they work for Scar and all that. Um, but the uh, the big change here is, it, like, because there, I feel like there could have been some things done to kind of blur the line more between comedy relief and what their purpose is, because it's like, obviously they're made to kill, but we never really see much of this. Um, but we do get some taste of it at the beginning, like, um, when they're, like, for, when they're chasing them, and then there's the moment when Nala's is, like, falling, and Shenzi almost gets her, and it's like, we're not really sure what would have happened if she did, because we're not really, we don't really know exactly how much they want to do what Scar wants them to do, <laughs> um, but, like, that, like, the moment when Simba scratches her across the face to save Nala, like, my first thought was, like, wouldn't it have made Shenzi kind of cool and threatening if she kept those scars for the rest of the movie? Um, but then it's like, well, I guess that'd be overkill because we've already got a villain literally named Scar that has a scar. It would have been a bit redundant, sure. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously Bonsai later gets, you know, scars on his ass and everything, but it's like, that's not even threatening. Even Ed is laughing at him because he knows how stupid it looks. Um, but the interesting thing about this is how it really seems like that they should be, like more threatening than they are is it's a I feel like it's a really nice contrast it takes their, literally their last moments to get to this I know that's a long time um but um the whole idea that we don't really see outside of their introduction scene sure because that makes sense uh they would seem threatening then but then once we get to know them we realize how silly they are really um, it's kind of the perfect contrast when we don't see them threatening like we did in their first scene again until they've turned on Scar, then they're absolutely terrifying. <laughs> um, and I think that's a really nice contrast, because it's like, like I said, it kind of shows that they kind of seem to not want to do what Scar wants them to do, but they just really have no other choice. Um, but I will actually get back to that when we're talking about the songs. Um, so the other slice of comedy relief here, obviously, which definitely is a tonal shift, is uh, Timon and Pumbaa. Um, which, obviously, they belong in the story, because of, you know, Rosen Rain and Gillenstern and all that. But the main thing here is that they're actually, like, unbelievably invaluable when you really look at it, because it's like, because you see them, you know, and you've got, like, you know, Pumbaa making fart jokes and all that, um, but the thing is, is it's like, they're kind of the heroes of the entire movie. Uh, like, at the very end, when they're celebrating on Pride Rock with everybody else, it's, like, so incredibly earned, given that when you look at back at what I was talking about, where we see the position Simba is in following... Mufasa's death, because Scar has completely convinced him and gaslighted him into thinking that Mufasa's death is his fault, and he caused this with his tiny little roar somehow, um, and then he, as soon as he has witnessed the death of his father and been right up close to the broken body and all that, he is chased off by hyenas, almost killed again, has to go through that whole thorny field thing, and as he's making his final escape, this tiny little child is being screamed at that if he ever returns to his home again, he's going to be murdered. Um, so, before Timon and Pumbaa find him laying in the middle of the desert, we're going to go ahead and assume here that he would have somehow lived if he, had woke, if he had woken up in the desert and eventually found, you know, shelter or whatever. Um... If that were the case, what would he have become? Because this sounds like a super villain origin story. <laughs> this is like... I mean, we talk about how evil Scar is, but it's like, whatever made Scar Scar, we don't really know. At least the movie doesn't tell us. 
Um, but we know all of this stuff happened to Simba when he was so incredibly young, and obviously his mind is extremely vulnerable to manipulation. It's hard to tell where he would have ended up, and the fact that Timon and Pumbaa came in with their fart jokes and their bugs and their Hakuna Matata basically saved the entire thing. <laughs> um, and made him not the totally insane lion he probably could have turned into under these circumstances. Um, so bring on the far jokes and the eating bugs and all that. Um, by all means. So, um, and, and the whole thing where they, they even, uh, at least when you're a child anyway, like, they actually make, like, bugs look and sound like they taste good. Uh, like, you know, all the more power to them for that, too. Uh, so as far as technical aspects go, um, I mean, there's obviously, the animation is obviously a huge standout. Um, and it's, and it's also worth noting, I actually want to say this at the beginning, I totally forgot. Uh, talking about the Disney Renaissance period, you'll notice that, um, we had, like, uh, The Little Mermaid, and then we had Beauty and the Beast. And Beauty and the Beast, you know, was, like, one of the most beloved anim animated movies ever. Was the first one to get a Best Picture nomination. Was seen as this absolutely monumental thing. So you think... What is their follow-up to that going to be? And how will it ever live up to it? Um, and the fact that they bring this in... Because there's the whole thing about um, how this was basically like the Team B in the uh, animation department because Team A was like... They were putting all their A game into Pocahontas at the time. Uh, thinking it was going to be the big deal, and Lion King was just kind of like this side project, um, which, <laughs> I mean, not, I don't, like, hate Pocahontas or anything, but, I mean, there is a, to me, anyway, there is a huge difference in the impact of those two movies. <laughs> um, and so, and, you, and like, how they did, like, a totally new thing to do the Stampede. The Stampede took, like, three years or something. Um, but on top of that, the, th the technical aspect that really stands out about um, The Lion King, obviously, is the score. I mean, sure, the music in general, because of the songs, uh, how they're all memorable. Um, but the score in particular by Zimmer, I believe still his only Oscar win. Um, probably one of my favorite scores ever. Uh, like, there's, like, like, as soon as anybody asks me that, like I said, score is not, like, my main area of expertise, but... It's it's a very simple go-to answer that I feel actually quite confident in when I say it. Um, that uh, score-wise, not much has topped this. To even to the point that not only is it just you know feel huge, but even it can make like even the simplest scene transitions feel totally completely epic. Like the um, I think it's called This Land that whole piece where. Um, it really gets to do its thing during the scene where we see Mufasa's ghost come back. But we actually get the beginning of this piece in this transition from uh, Zazu and Mufasa walking away after they've, you know, had the altercation with Scar at the very beginning. And then it's this transition from that to the rain to Rafiki's tree. And the music with just this tiny transition from one scene to the next feels like the most epic thing in the entire world. <laughs> it's like just even scene transitions feel massive. Um, and the score has so much to do with that, uh, it's insane. Um, and then it's like, in, in just the way the, it like enhances the visuals, like as that storm is brewing. Um, it's something that it does like throughout the entire movie, and just the, when it hits those big moments, like I said, when, you know, Mufasa comes back, and the Remember Who You Are scene, it's just, it, it, and then the, of course, the, the very last scene when, Simba finally ascends Pride Rock in the rain and all that, it's like, it's indescribable, really. Like, I just have to tell you what the scenes are, and I hope you're thinking, yes, that is amazing, I remember that. <laughs> um, so, obviously, on top of that also, um, we've got the songs by Elton John, and the thing here is that, the great thing about this is that there are no, almost, there's almost no throwaway songs at all. Like, even the best musicals ever have their Cheer Up Charlie. Every, every musical ever has at least the one song where you're like, I could do without this, or I could probably skip this, or whatever. Um, I, none of the songs in Lion are like that for me. Unless you're watching this version that they put out in, like, the 2002 area, 2002 or 2003 area, um, where they added the song Morning Report. <laughs> um, you can watch the theatrical version on this DVD also, which is pretty much the movie without Morning Report. I think, like, the, the animation is supposed to be, like, relatively smoother or something, but uh, I don't really see much of a difference except for the fact that Morning Report's on the way. 
So, and I, and I do kind of, you know, understand his purpose where, like, you know, it is very upbeat and it does kind of further add to the, you know, eventual contrast of the looming darkness and all that. Um, but they put, and they, and they awkwardly put the pouncing scene in the middle of it, uh, and it's just weird. They brought in some other dude that's not Rowan Atkinson to record it, um, and it's like, I, I, I don't know why they felt the need to, like, put that in there. Like, as, like, a deleted scene, maybe, but, like, to actually try to put it back into the movie for this special edition, um, I, I, I don't know. I'm not really feeling that, so, <laughs> um, but apart from that, um, and I because I do think this version was, like, they did, like, an IMAX re-release around the time this DVD came out and they were and that was in there and everything and they also like changed the credits and all that but um, it, it, it really could just stay the way it is with no other issues um, but then you have stuff like uh, be prepared this is where I was going to bring back the hyena thing where it's like the hyenas don't really despite how evil we know Scar is um, they don't really take him seriously. And really, the audience at the time probably doesn't take him seriously until this song. That's how crucial and important it is. Um, because, I mean, it does, like, there is, like, a build-up to him, like, the way he lures Simba to the graveyard and all that. And then, um, after the whole thing with the hyenas has happened, we see him lurking so incredibly evilly above. Um, but we never really truly feel just how much evil is coming from him until this song, for sure. Like, like I said, even the hyenas, I think, kind of view it that way. Um, and then eventually, you know, leads all the way up to the Nazi symbolism and all that. Uh, on top of everything else you could say about him. Um, so I think that's really crucial also. And then there is the segment, uh, getting close to the climax, uh, which which is a word I did not want to use talking about the can you feel the love tonight scene but here we are so um, this first off it's always been kind of funny to me if you want to look at it from a bit of a cynical perspective where it's um, you, this being the end credit song also it's like it could almost be seen as like this cynical sarcasm to have it be the end credit song to a movie about family members killing each other for power um, but in regards to the scene it's actually in um, there is something here where this, I'm trying to think of how to describe this. It's sort of like when, when obviously, like I said, being one of my earliest movie memories, obviously this would not have been the, the first time I saw it. But as I was kind of getting older and more like the 9 or 10 area, um, in between that time, obviously Can You Feel the Love Tonight is probably going to be the, the boring song. The part where when you're a kid, you just kind of want to skip by because it really means nothing to you. It's the, you know ooey gooey part or whatever but the thing here is that I feel like if I remember correctly this scene and thinking back on it was kind of the first time I remember finding anything romantic uh, like it was kind of my first experience of sort of seeing anything that way um, I didn't go as far as to the whole like uh, I know Eddie Redmayne recently talked about this among other people uh, the whole kind of having this weird attraction and all thing I didn't go that far but I felt the romanticism, which, like I said, I kind of feel like was probably the first time I felt that, at least seeing something in a movie that made me realize what that was. Um, and uh, and apparently the whole thing, they actually wanted to, like, cut it or something, and Elton John actually had to convince them to put it back in, um, despite being this crucial scene where Simba and all, like, really unite. Um, but the thing here also is uh, it ended up being his Oscar win, so I'm sure he's pleased about that too. <laughs> um, but talking about the love story angle of this also, there is another song I neglected to mention because lately it's kind of a song that I see from kind of a different light than I used to, and I don't know if other people feel this way or not, or if I'm just saying something that sounds weird and crazy, but... Um, Go all the way back to the beginning, <laughs> um, to uh, the uh, Just Can't Wait to Be King number, where I, I know the uh, the popular joke is, oh, he's singing about his, he's excited that his dad's going to die and he doesn't realize it, huh? Um, but I've kind of started seeing that song in a different way, and that's mainly because of the conversation that comes right before it, which is when they're walking to supposedly the watering hole, but, um, and Zazu stops them and says, hey, you know, you guys are betrothed, you're going to be married and all that. Isn't that great? Uh, and of course, because they're children, they're grossed out by that. And they think, you know, like, we're friends, that's disgusting. 
Um, but it's almost like they start headed in that direction through this song, once again, without even realizing it because they're children and they don't quite know what that even is. Um, and with that in mind, I Just Can't Wait to Be King sort of kind of becomes a bit of a romantic number. A romantic's kind of an odd choice of words because I don't really know another one to use because they're children who haven't figured that out. But obviously, it's, it's talking about being king, so it's supposed to be Simba's song, singularly, um, with him kind of doing banter with Zazu throughout it. But through this entire number, with him singing that, he and Nala are constantly together. They're making faces at Zazu together, they're prancing around under the elephants together, and even up to the point to where the big, big, giant ending to the song when he just keeps repeating, I just can't wait to be king, and it's they, it's revealed that he's at the top of all that giant stack of animals. But it's not just him by himself, it's both of them. <laughs> so it's like this whole foreshadowing of, it's Simba talking about being king, but it's this huge thing about the fact that they're both destined for royalty, and this is their future together and not just his. So I actually almost find that as romantic in the long run as I do, like, the Can You Feel the Love Tonight scene. Um, so, I mean, I've actually only started seeing it that way recently, but, uh, so yeah, but yes, also, if you want to go that route, yeah, his dad's gonna die. Hilarious. Um, so, and I think that's, uh, uh, without dragging this out too long, that might be about all of the crucial things I really want to say about it. Um, obviously, it's continuing to stand the test of time. One thing that really stood out to me that actually made me really happy was, you'll remember, my god, it was already seven years ago, 2011, when they re-released it in 3D, um, which was a joy to revisit for sure, but the great thing about that was, if I remember correctly, um, I'm sure there'll be some pedantic asshole out there that will correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the idea was that the 3D re-release in 2011 was going to last for two weeks. There was even like a standee in the theater lobby that said like a two-week event only. Like only was in big letters. Um, but it was, like, so incredibly successful that they just said, screw it. And even even when it passed the two weeks, they just said, we'll just leave it out till people stop going. And it was, I feel like it was out for a while. Um, and for... Th 3D re-releases didn't really do that. I remember when I saw the 3D re-release of The Phantom Menace the following year, it was pretty packed. But obviously those died out very fast. Because they were going to try to make them, like, a regular thing, and then... You know, by the end of 2012, they'd already called it quits. I think Monsters, Inc. was the last one they did, because they were going to do The Little Mermaid, and then they just called it off entirely. Um, at least around here, I don't know if they did it in total, but... Um, and then they just disappeared. But um, And obviously, the 3D craze dying, uh, rightfully, helped. But um, even so, the fact that it s stood out even that long in a scenario like that... Um, I think is really telling of how much people still love it. And of course, like, that's even, that's just stating the obvious, that people still love this. Um, like, every now and then there's that really, really, really rare person that kind of has a bone to pick with it, but very few and far between. And, yeah, if you want to talk about a bias of growing up with it and all that and knowing all its ins and outs, I, I'm sure that's in there, but I, I don't care. And that kind of comes into with the whole thing about uh, Kimba the White Lion. Uh, which I kind of have to admittedly say something about, which is, that was like, what, the 60s or something? And the whole thing about plagiarism and going through all of that, and how it's like ridiculously similar, to the point that I think even I read that Matthew Broderick, when he signed on for this, just kind of assumed they were like the same thing, like intentionally. Um, but it, I, I, I guess there's like a whole thing there. And I, like I, the, the thing about this, though, is that I really feel like I should probably care about it more than I do, is kind of the problem. Because um, obviously being as in love with this movie as I am, it's unfortunately easy for me to dismiss. But the other thing also is that even though I have heard that it's like so incredibly blatantly obvious, I mean, even the heroes' names are only one letter apart, but I hear it gets like really down to the details specific in how similar they are to the point that it is alarming. Um, but I don't, like, know what those... Like, I've never... I've heard about it, and I've seen stuff in, like, headlines, but I've never actually looked into it. Because I... Un admittedly just didn't care enough. Uh, so... But th that's out there. So... Uh... So, yeah, so as the movie stands by itself, um... Like, like I was talking about, some childhood favorites 
will fade out. Like you, like that's that's what bugs me about the whole nostalgia argument. So many people throw around now is there are childhood favorites that will undoubtedly fade out. Everybody has them, and sometimes there will just be those ones that stand the test of time. Um, like I said, whether there's a bias or not, if it's if they stick around and they don't fade out, I still think that says something about them, regardless of how dated they might be. Which I don't think this is or anything. Just as a wide example of the whole nostalgia argument. Um, and so this, and like I said, when it gets to, when the circle of life comes back around for that reprise and the new cub is brought forward and Rafiki raises him and the song ends on that note and we get the bookend of that cut to black again with the title in red, there's still just nothing like that. After 24 years, there's nothing that replicates that feeling that that's, that those, any, anything in this movie really does. Um... And I think that's another thing, too, where it's like you hear, like, oh, it plagiarized something. But, I mean, you feel something this powerful from a movie. And it's like, even if, you know, s things were taken, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, obviously, you know, it's this was going to have an advantage because it had, like, the Disney name on it. It was much more put out in the public, sure. Um, but, I mean, still, to be this powerful, there's, there is something, like, inherently to it that is all its own and has its own power and just, like I said, just has stood on these two giant legs for all these years already and will continue to. And like I said, even in the whole Disney canon, right, it, being the follow-up of Beauty and the Beast, you would think would have been the death of this before it even happened. Um, and the fact that it's now considered, like, one of the best ever... Um, or the best ever, depending on who you're talking to, um, it just really says everything about it. So that's how I feel about that. So uh, we can go on to uh, The Jungle Book. I warned about before, um, The Jungle Book is never a movie that I was like totally passionate about. I do understand that uh, not only does it have a huge you know, fan base, of course, and is definitely one of the most popular of the Disney animated movies, particularly the classics, but there is obviously a bit of another life this movie leads in regards to uh, where exactly it stands in time. Not necessarily just based on the quality of the movie, but the whole idea that this, this of course, was the movie that um, Walt Disney died during the production of. Like, it's the last Disney animated movie that was supervised by him. So... It took on this, in one way, it took on this reputation of basically being the movie that saved animation for Disney, uh, um, to my understanding, where it was, once he died, like, it was all up in the air and they weren't sure, like, where money was going to come from, if the studio was going to be able to survive and all that, the the animation department specific, especially. Um, but then the movie ended up obviously being this enormous success and the rest is history, pretty much. Um, but e even despite, you know, being its own sort of treasure in that way alone, um, it is, it is beloved for sure, but, um, I have seen the argument uh, every now and then where, like, mainly from, like, you know, critics of the past or whatever, that it's one of the most beloved of the animated Disney classics, if not the most beloved I don't, I'm not quite sure where that comes from, unless I'm just hanging out in the wrong circles or whatever, but I mean, when you've got the likes of, like, even the movies that came before it, like, you know, Snow White, and Bambi, and Fantasia, and Pinocchio, and it's like, to me, it's always, even not taking into account the movies that came after it, it always, quality-wise, was pretty low on the totem pole, for me, anyway, um... And, it, like I said, I mean, if you want to say it's, like, one of the most popular, you, obviously. Um, but as far as quality goes, I think that also has a lot to do with the fact that, um, I mean, it, it is, like, a really, really, really paper-thin story. Because, um, I mean, obviously we've we come from the um, Rudyard Kipling... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Rudyard Kipling books. But apart from that, um, it, it feels like they didn't really... I think not only is the story thin also, but there is, um, when you looked at it, when you look back to, like, you know, Snow White and then Fantasia and all that in the, in Pinocchio in, like, the late 30s, early 40s era, um, the thing that really stood out the most about these, not just that their stories were strong in general and the characters were really strong, but the animation in particular just really stood out in this really unique way that still feels unique to those movies now, all these years later, which is... 
a lot, a lot more than 24 years, for sure. Um, so, the thing here, though, is that once we got in this area, um, shortly before everything seemed to kind of a bit die off, before the re Renaissance eventually happened, um, the animation all kind of felt very similar, like this and Robin Hood and in that area like that. Um, so the movies kind of stopped standing out as much as they used to. Um, and we kind of got in this sort of what felt like a rut, where they were just kind of getting churned out a little bit. Um, but that's not to say that it doesn't have, like, really memorable characters in it, and some of the, like I said, maybe not, you know, the general animation, but, like, the characters are brought to life in a really nice way, especially with the whole sort of taking, like I said, it was kind of the beginning of the taking on of the morphing the, uh, animated characters from the actors' performances as they were doing the voices and all that, and making them sort of look like their characters. Um, George Sanders most specifically, obviously. Um, but, there, and there is, like, you know, a liveliness to it, uh, from the songs and, you know, the way the characters behave, particularly towards each other and all that, that does, you know, keep it alive, um, and kind of helps it across this sort of, it just kind of has a lack of direction, it feels like. I mean, there it is coming to a point, eventually, um, to where it's sort of like, because usually we had, um, whether it be, you know, adaptations before this, um, like the Korda movie with Sabu, or the newer ones like Andy Serkis's Mowgli and Favreau's Jungle Book, um, the fo a lot of focus is on Mowgli, of course. Um, but Disney kind of stuck to their strengths here and sort of made the animals still kind of the whole standout thing and the thing we really tend to focus on, because the story here seems to be unlike those also. Um, Oh, and the uh, Stephen Summers movie with Jason Scott Lee also. Um, it was just kind of like, it felt like a middle portion, or really a beginning. Uh, whereas this one's kind of showing the end of Mowgli's life in the jungle. And it's sort of like, the ending is like the starting point for the new life he eventually went to. So when you, when you have to know that to feel like the movie is going somewhere, really. <laughs> um, and, that, and that's not to say that it has to be going somewhere. Um, because, if, like I said, if it's lively enough, and if the subbies just by themselves work, like, just self-contained, um, you can make something that works. But this movie, to me, always kind of felt like it, there's just, it's just, it's a little too paper thin, and there's, the animation and all that other stuff don't quite stand out in the way they do. And there's only, like, a couple of standout songs. Like, the, the, the Bare Necessities, obviously, and I Want to Be Like You, and stuff like that. Um, and trust in me, I guess, um, but I think it's more so, I actually think it's more the voice work and less the songs themselves when it comes to those. Um, because you've got, like, um, I mean, when you look at the voice work in general, um, like I said, this is kind of when they really started to bring in, you know, more recognizable voices. Uh, I think this was also the first movie that showed, like, the cast list at the beginning, the first... Disney animated movie that showed the cast list so you could see that there were recognizable names in it. Um, and it's still, they still do something like that. Sometimes it's not, what, the interesting thing about this is that it was back at a time where it was less that the voice name, the names of them were recognizable, but their voices were what you recognize. Like, um, sometimes the scenes between, you know, Mowgli and Call might stand out as a weird way because you might just hear Christopher Robin and Pooh talking to each other. Um, but then you've got stuff like, you know, Phil Harris doing Bolu, which is just iconic, obviously. Um, and just, you kind of only associate it with that, especially his voice, you know, is, you know, synonymous with the Bare Necessities, and together as a whole, they create something that we'll remember forever. It ends up getting an Oscar nomination, too, yet losing to that Dr. Doolittle song. But, um, but then there's also, like I said, the, um, choice to do George Sanders as Shere Khan, where he does have this, uh, much like Scar, he's obviously got this evil quality because they build up the whole time. He doesn't even show up to, like, the very end, and they, they spend the whole movie building it up about how ferocious he is and how he's this impending doom that Mowgli's gonna have to get out of the jungle to avoid. Um, but when we meet him for the most part, he's just kind of got this air of sinister sophistication to him. Uh, there's even the point in time where uh, Ka's going to try to hypnotize him like he's been doing Mowgli, and he just kind of does, has no reaction to this except to basically back Ka away and say, like, you know, I have no time for that sort of nonsense. Uh, and so it's like, just the little time he's there, he makes the absolute most of, and the fact that they 
combined him, more so than any of the other actors to my understanding, combined his performance with the animation itself, uh, really stands out and you can really tell. There's the uh, case of King Louis, who is obviously memorably voiced by uh, Louis Prima, which is really interesting because you talk about uh, all the stuff that's controversial today and a lot of people saying that, you know, this is like a really too sensitive time where people get offended by everything, but it's like, it's my understanding if you look back, uh, even in 1967, I guess audiences actually pointed out that they thought it was racist, uh, that King Louis has what people seem to think was with like his voice and the way he was animated, that he was basically supposed to be like black or like represent uh, black, like in a stereotypical sort of way. Despite the fact that he was modeled animation wise after Louis Prima and voiced by Louis Prima, who is an Italian white guy using his regular voice. Uh, <laughs> oops. Um, but the, also, the other interesting thing about Louis to look back on is the idea that, um, the fact that he wasn't in the novel and they created him for this. And I think it's, um, it was the whole thing, I think I mentioned this in the Mowgli review too, about the whole thing of, uh, basically he wasn't in the novel because orangutans weren't in India and stuff like that. But it's like, it's interesting to compare something like that uh, to them creating a character that's, like, specifically out of place when you look at, kind of, all the research they do now. Like, when you look at, um, like, the making of Nemo, uh, how they did all that, like, really, really extensive research about the ocean to get all the animation right and specific. Um, it just kind of shows the contrast of what they did then and what they're doing now, which is, uh, really interesting. Um... And then just every now and then, um, including the songs, uh, there'll be some recognizable voices. There is, um, one of the baby elephants is Clint Howard, who you, obviously, Ron Howard's brother, you know from all, most of Ron Howard's movies and more, um, had this really cool story. He was doing, uh, Kevin Pollock's chat show, and he was telling the story about when he was doing the voice work for this, for the baby elephant, he was like five or six or something. Um, and they were doing one of the recording sessions for the song that they do, and he was at the piano and all that, and doing the singing, and then, like, out of nowhere, somebody comes in through the door, and just pops their head in, and says, you're doing a good job, Clint, and, like, called him by name, and then that was it, and he kind of disappeared into the night, and it was Walt Disney. <laughs> um, and this, and it was, like, really not long after that that he died, um... And even at five and six years old, and how old he is now, Clint Howard has still, like, carried that vivid image in his mind, which is really easy to see why. So uh, I, always, I always really liked that story. And then you look at that, um, and you also... Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the ending, I wanted to mention before we ended. Um, the whole thing about Mowgli leaving the jungle and seeing the girl and going back to, you know, civilization and all that... Um, there is, uh, apparently there was a thing there where the animator really did not want to do that ending, uh, where he thought it was, like, just really, and, and it, it, when you watch it, it does feel, like, very abrupt and very sudden, and it's like, well, the movie has to end somehow, but I guess Disney was, like, really adamant about it and insisted that that be the ending, whether the animators liked it or not, um, and the animator, apparently, as he was animating it, ended up, like, falling in love with the scene and, like, absolutely agreeing and saying it's the perfect ending and all that. Um, you know, maybe Disney saying trust in me and hypnotized him, but I, I'm gonna say, but that, also when you look at it, the way the animation, this is kind of like the one scene where the animation does stand out in a way, where you have, uh, like the scene with the water and the ripples and all that kind of brings back the memory of the wishing well and Snow White, um, so that's kind of nice. And then the whole thing of, you know, um, them walking off into the sunset, it being the last shot, and how people, I think, kind of equated that with sort of Disney being himself being sent off into the sunset so i mean it is easy to see how like people so there are people that like credited the movie as a claim to it being disney's send off and being that sort of having that sentimental value to it um but you know i do i i can get to an extent if people like really 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 love this i i still think that's it's a little too basic and there's kind of it need, there needs to maybe just be a little more to it um, but, and maybe, you know, some more memorable, you know, imagery and some of the songs to maybe be a bit catchier, but, um, like I said, it is, it has, once again, much like The Lion King, lasted for this long, but like I said, really, really lacks the impact, just that real huge punch that so many of those others have, particularly, like I said, the ones that came before it, um, and then, you know, many years after, like The Lion King, but, um, it's, it's okay.
So that's how I feel about that. So that's going to be this one. There's going to be one more for this month, this year, whatever. Um, it's, I'm gonna. It is gonna be the one that I've been saying it's gonna be. The it's gonna be two novel-based epics, I guess. Epic is a is a, not the greatest word for one of them, but they tried, I guess. So, um, and then, yeah, and the reviews, which I'll probably have to shoot, like, now. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. So, until whatever the hell comes next, that's it.